we have three speakers. We have three panel speakers. Um, Victor um, Danisiko, excuse me if I if I do not pronounce your name right. Um, he's a professor. He's an associate professor at General Jonathan Matisse Military Academy of Lithuania and Venice University. Please feel free to correct me if I do not pronounce those names right. He got his PhD in communication and information in 2016 and uh, at Vilnius University, the field of his scientific and professional interests include propaganda, information warfare, and political communication. Victor is the author of the book in Encirclement of Propaganda, published with Vilnius University Press in 2021. And I'm going to introduce all the, you know, panel speakers all together, and then we'll, we'll move forward to our presentations. Gregor, uh, Gregor Rich Mazanikov, I'm sorry, pardon me, is okay. a political is a political scientist, president of the Institute for Public Affairs, um, Bratislava, Slovakia. He has published numerous ex, um, expert studies on party system development and political aspects of transformation in post communist societies, illiberal and authoritarian tendencies, populism, extremism, nationalism, and hybrid threats in various monographs, collections, and scholarly journals in Slovenia and other countries. He regularly contributes and analysis of Slovakia's political scene to domestic and foreign media. Since 1993, he has been an external correspondent for Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe. He has edited and authored dozens of books, including the Global Reports on Slo um, Slovakia from 1995 to 2011 the comprehensive analysis of countries' development in all relevant sectors of society. He is a key author of the report on Slovakia in Nations in Transit, published by Fred and House in, from um, 1998 to 2014. In 2006, he was awarded by Reagan Fiscal Fellowship by the National Endowment for Democracy based in Washington, D.C. In 2012, he was a research fellow of Taiwan Fellowship Program at the Department of Political Science and National Taiwan University in Taipei, where he, he researched similarities and differences of democratization and fellow of the um, democratization and civil society development in Taiwan and in Central Europe. In 2019 to 2021, he was a research fellow of the Institute for Human Science, Institute for Di... Another really... Another word really hard to pronounce. Vincent Trostrochten, um, von Mestren, um, in Vienna at the Europe's Future Program. And I'm going to introduce our last speaker, um, Tehomia Donchiba is an experienced communicator, researcher, and project manager, um, manager on multidisciplinary topics related to the problems and challenges, opportunities, and values of the liberal democratic society. She has joined AUBG in the summer of 2022 adding the university's flash, flag, flagship um, initiatives to reinvigorate AUBG's founding mission through the IDC, the Homeworld aims to educate students and interested stakeholders to be engaged, informed, critical democratic citizens who will be committed to the rule of law, pluralism, and inclusiveness 
and open discussion, free press, and respect for human rights. She has worked as a journalist for one of the most professional media outlets, Capital, and has been a researcher for the NATO Strategic Communication Centers of Excellence in Riga. Working on Malay influence across the Western Balkans, over the last three years, she worked for a strategic communication company based in London, UK, where she, where her portfolio included a variety of projects from countries um, sent countering disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, fake news, media development, and information resilience, to countering violent extremism and terrorism in countries across the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. She's a published author of reports on information influence activities in the Western Balkans and has also developed two separate apps on countering disinformation for journalists. And I am Fan Yang, a um, research assistant at Deakin University. I work with ESAM. So I will be moderate, I will be moderating the panel for this session. So shall we start with um, Victor? Okay, of course. Um, I will share my presentation. It's uh, more pictures uh, here, and I will try to present uh, everything during 15 minutes, I think. Uh, okay, uh, my topic is Kremlin's information war against the collective West view from Lithuania, but um, in the beginning uh, it will be some remarks. Um, my view may be not uh, only from Lithuania, but in general from Baltic states, free Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, because our experience is quite similar uh, in this topic. Uh, and uh, also uh, I will talk more about uh, this Kremlin's information war uh, in general. Uh, and I will start from some uh, historical uh, background because it's quite uh, quite um, important when we're talking to international audience. Um, uh, so we could start from uh, collapse of Soviet Union. And for Baltic states, it was very uh, important uh, moment in history uh, because, uh, in fact, in 1940, Soviet Union um, sized Baltic states. It was kind of a hybrid war or hybrid warfare. Today, it's very, very uh, like a fashionable um, uh, world, but uh, in general, uh, Soviet Union uh, have this. Uh, experience to implement some uh, hybrid aggression and the Baltic states uh, uh, were victims of this hybrid aggression. And of course, uh, the collapse of Soviet Union for Baltic states uh, was very uh, meaningful because it was possibility to back uh, to map of Europe as independent states. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, to choose own um, uh, geopolitical orientation and uh, own vector of uh, integration. And of course, this vector was uh, integration back to Europe, integration back to, uh, in fact, Western world. Uh, also, I could mention one like a provocative uh, thing. Uh, uh, we could uh, ask question when information warfare uh, as uh, phenomenon starts, and uh, I think in many books you could find that uh, um, this uh, uh, war in Iraq in 1991 was first information war because it was first war uh, broadcasted uh, live. Uh, uh, it also was uh, like informational struggles uh, uh, between Baghdad and uh, allies. Um, uh, uh, who who fight uh, against Baghdad uh, to uh, to uh, 
for Kuwait and, and so on. But also it's very interesting that in Lithuania, we could say that, you know, first information war, yes, it was in 1991. And uh, it was in, in fact in Lithuania. And it was uh, information war between Lithuania and Moscow as a center of uh, still existing Soviet Union. Um, because um, uh, in January 1991, uh, uh, it was very painful uh, events in uh, Vilnius. Uh, Moscow tried to use the uh, Soviet army uh, to uh, break down uh, uh, Lithuanian um, independence uh, because uh, Lithuania uh, uh, officially declared re-establishment of uh, independence of a state uh, on March 11, 1999, but of course Moscow not recognized it. And uh, it was uh, very big tensions uh, uh, between uh, Lithuania and uh, Moscow as a center of uh, Soviet Union. And in January 1991, uh, Moscow used the Soviet army. Um, uh, they say that, for example, TV tower, uh, TV center, say that, in fact, uh, Lithuanian uh, television um, also uh, size that uh, press house uh, and uh, um, sto uh, it, it was to, in fact uh, banned uh, main Lithuanian newspapers at the moment uh, uh, and some civilian people uh, uh, was killed during this event killed by Soviet army and uh, Moscow uh, like a um, propagate uh, conspiracy theory uh, which is still like uh, Moscow use it still uh, and conspiracy theory was uh, that uh, it's Lithuanians or some powers in Lithuania killed with uh, civil uh, people to accuse of course Moscow of uh, brutality and so on. Um, um, so in fact we could say that uh, we know what information war uh, is and uh, we know how Moscow could um, use it. Uh, also, uh, first decade uh, after Soviet Union uh, collapse, uh, I could say that uh, uh, Lithuania, but also Latvia and Estonia, we also face it kind of uh, you know, like a, pro a propaganda struggle against us. And uh, in this propaganda struggle, um, Russia used uh, some real tensions and some imaginary tensions. Uh, one of the most pop popular topic of uh, uh, this uh, information struggle was question about uh, Russian minorities in Baltic states, or better to say Russian speaking minorities in Baltic states. Here also it's a very specific topic because uh, you should uh, uh, understand and you could imagine. Uh, Soviet Union in fact was like a modern Russian empire in some kind. And uh, it was quite uh, a lot of uh, um, inner migration in Soviet Union and uh, um, in Latvia and uh, Estonia and also in Lithuania uh, was quite uh, big, quite big uh, Russian or Russian speaking uh, communities, uh, which in Soviet time was like a part of this uh, uh, imperial majority. And after collapse of Soviet Union, uh, all uh, people who uh, was in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia with Russian, Russian speaking people, people uh, during one night they became uh, national minorities. It's uh, an, another situation for, for, for these persons. And uh, also was some real problem in this slide, you could see uh, so-called alliance passport, it's an official name of this passport. It's passport of non-citizen of uh, Estonia. Uh, and um, it was uh, uh, after after this collapse of Soviet Union, Estonia and Latvia uh, not automatically provide citizenship for uh, all inhabitants uh, because uh, Latvia and Estonia um, they was afraid that uh, this big uh, Russian speaking communities could uh, made a big influence to political field um, and it's kind of threat 
for Estonia and Latvia. Lithuania provides citizenship for everyone, uh, who, for everyone inhabitant who wants, because in Lithuania, with the Russian speaking uh, minority uh, is not so big. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Moscow accused, uh, first of all, Estonia and Latvia of uh, breaking uh, uh, rules, uh, um, uh, violating um, uh, rights of uh, national minorities and so on. But also uh, uh, in this information struggle was very, quite, quite many like uh, imaginary topics or uh, uh, or so on. Uh, for example, it's very it's very interesting. Uh, uh, Moscow quite painful uh, reacted to every uh, event or incident uh, uh, linked to this Russian speaking minorities in Baltic states. But in similar situation, uh, when it was uh, most uh, or more. Uh, painful events, uh, for example, in um, former uh, Soviet republics in Central Asia, this uh, reaction was uh, much more soft. Why? Because Baltic states choose another ge geopolitical paradigm. Uh, Baltic states uh, choose this integration to Western world. And uh, this uh, uh, states in Central Asia, in fact, um, uh, way you know, like a uh, they choose this uh, uh, integration paradigm with Russia uh, still. So it, it was also political, uh, political thing. Um, also quite interesting if uh, we, uh, when we're looking to these narratives of Kremlin propaganda, I could say um, Baltic states, in fact, was kind of training ground. Uh, because uh, many narratives which uh, uh, Russia used later against Ukraine, uh, it's quite similar or uh, um, a little bit uh, uh, changed uh, for situation in Ukraine, but it's quite similar uh, for narratives which uh, were used uh, uh, against Baltic states, uh, in fact, science uh, uh, collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, I'm really sorry uh, this illustration is in Lithuanian language is from, from my article, but uh, I will try explain. It's uh, uh, like a, here it's um, narratives uh, about Baltic states. Here it's narratives about propaganda. It's from uh, this Kremlin uh, propaganda, traditional narratives, I could say. And we could find uh, many similarities. Uh, for example, that, of course, uh, Baltic states and Ukraine uh, violating the rights of uh, Russian speaking people or, or, uh, uh, or Russian uh, uh, minorities, um, uh, but in Baltic states as, as well as in Ukraine, it's uh, growing up uh, Nazism, neo-Nazism, fascism and so on. Uh, all bad things from <laughs> World War II. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Baltic auto, uh, authorities of Baltic states are selfish and uh, not care uh, about uh, own society and uh, authorities of Ukraine it's uh, not legitimate uh, after Euromaidan and so on and so on. In reality, it's quite, quite many similarities uh, which allow us to talk about some tradition in this um, uh, narratives. Also, uh, of course, in Baltic states, uh, we uh, all time uh, were quite critical about Russia. And uh, I could say that uh, on one hand, um, of course, this painful historical experience uh, making influence to our evaluation of uh, Russia. Uh, from uh, On another hand, uh, also, uh, we know Russia, and we could uh, uh, like analyze processes uh, in uh, Russian Federation quite well. Uh, for example, my, my native language is Russian. My uh, mother tongue is Russian, and they could uh, uh, quite deeply analyze all these narratives. Um, uh, but uh, during quite a long time after the Soviet Union collapse, uh, Lithuania and uh, another Baltic states uh, were evaluated in Western world as alarmists. 
Yeah, but we are too much afraid about Russia. Russia is not a Soviet Union anymore. Uh, Russia um, not a threat to anyone. Yeah, but uh, of course, uh, uh, in fact, everything changed year 2015. Uh, uh, I like this illustration very much. It's uh, This illustration is from Crimea. Uh, and it's poster uh, to so-called uh, referendum in Crimea in March uh, uh, 2013. And uh, it's quite visible as, uh, I could say, primitive propaganda uh, they used uh, uh, for this event um, staged by, by Kremlin because it's a, uh, the words are very simple, but uh, during referendum on March 16, we will choose between between two, two possibilities. Yeah, one possibility, of course, Crimea in uh, as part of Russia, very peaceful, very nice, or another possibility, uh, as you could understood, it's a possibility uh, uh, of Crimea um, uh, with Ukraine, it's uh, concentration camp. Yeah, <laughs> Nazi style concentration camp. It's very primitive propaganda, but it, it was used uh, uh, during uh, these events. And um, if you're talking about, uh, for example, uh, this um, system of Kremlin propaganda um, and uh, evaluation of West or collective West, it's also a very interesting thing, because if you will look to uh, narratives of uh, Kremlin pro propaganda nowadays, uh, you could find what uh, in reality or in reality of Kremlin, it's not uh, Russia invite Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, Russia uh, defending himself uh, against uh, Ukraine, which is uh, a puppet of uh, Western powers. And in fact, it's a uh, war against uh, Western powers, uh, Western war against R Russia. Uh, it's uh, also just uh, two examples I could find a lot. Uh, and the narrative is similar. Uh, one narrative of so-called uh, military expert and another narrative of uh, uh, Mr. Lavrov, it's uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation, it's similar uh, messages that uh, it's uh, Western powers and West push Ukraine to war with Russia. Or uh, in this quotation of Lavrov, but uh, uh, West push Ukraine to continue war against Russia. Um, so, uh, uh, it's it's very interesting, and, and, and I could say what uh, this system of uh, Kremlin propaganda uh, definition of sharp power. Yeah, it's uh, our topic uh, anyway. Uh, it's quite uh, uh, it's it's good definition for this uh, uh, phenomenon uh, because uh, the, this. Um, Kremlin grows, uh, grow up a huge machine of uh, propaganda, and this machine have uh, like a different aspects. It's official channels like RT or Sputnik or uh, some non-official uh, channels, some uh, media which pretend to be like a, a real journalism, but uh, in reality are just uh, also. Uh, tool of propaganda, it's also trolls, yeah, trolls uh, um, <laughs> phenomenon, uh, we could say, uh, and uh, why I could say what sharp power, in fact, is perfect definition, because um, Kremlin uh, uh, using this system of uh, propaganda on, also on one hand, uh, like an additional tool of hard power, and we could see it today in context of uh, uh, Russian war against Ukraine. But also, uh, it could be evaluated as kind of autonomic system uh, to make uh, or to make uh, not visible influence on uh, societies or uh, even political elites of some other states. Um, uh, and 
one more thing which which I want to mention and uh, forgot it mentioned a little bit before. Uh, you know, uh, in Lithuania, uh, before this uh, uh, February 24, a few months, uh, journalists uh, asked me as an expert, uh, does it possible like a, a conventional war of uh, Russia against Ukraine? And I was one of few experts who said that it is possible. It is possible. Uh, and not because I am so uh, analytically br brilliant, but just because uh, in this Russian uh, or Kremlin propaganda, uh, four or five months before this uh, conventional war, I saw very clear how uh, they started to push everywhere this one main narrative that it is West, uh, Western powers, NATO or United States, who pushing Ukraine to war against Russia. And uh, uh, it was kind of deja vu because something uh, similar I saw in 2008 uh, before uh, uh, war in Georgia. Also, five days war in Georgia in August uh, 28. Um, so uh, I could say maybe what uh, uh, my final remarks. When we are looking to this Kremlin propaganda uh, from Lithuania, when we look into Kremlin propaganda from Baltic states or Eastern Europe um, in general, I could say that way which Russia passed from the collapse of the Soviet Union to war against Ukraine, uh, from our perspective or our point of view, unfortunately, uh, it, this way was quite logical. Uh, and it's not a uh, kind of anomaly or something. And maybe here I could just uh, only repeat, unfortunately. So uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, let's welcome our next speaker. And then um, well, let's welcome next speaker, Gregor H. Would you like to share your slides with us? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for introduction. Uh, my name is Grigory Mesezhnikov. I am the head of the Institute for Public Affairs, which is independent analytical center, think tank, and I am political scientist dealing, besides all other things, with the hybrid threats, especially in the last years, and with the Russian information war against uh, Central European countries. So I'm not a newcomer in the sharp power agenda. Uh, five years ago, uh, International Forum for Democratic Studies uh, published the uh, paper, Sharp Power, Rising Authoritarian Influence, and I'm one of the co-authors of, uh, of this publication. Th that time, two countries, two states were chosen for analyzing of their sharp power and four countries, so it, Russia and China, and four countries, four states in South America and Central Europe also were chosen for analysis of the consequences of the application of soft power by these two, uh, two states uh, in these countries, uh, Argentine, Peru, and uh, Poland and Slovakia. So I am the author of the chapter about Slovakia. Why uh, researchers uh, five years ago decided to start to concept conceptualize uh, the issue of sharp power? Because the known uh, approach in explaining, describing of activities of uh, states in the field of public uh, diplomacy, presentation of uh, the national experience with social development and so on, the known methods uh, somehow showed themselves not very efficient in case of authoritarian states. So states which were more focused on 
uh, not on the presentation of positive alternatives of national experience with social development, achievements in public life and economy, but rather they were focused on the promotion of the values which were not in full compliance with the values or uh, social habits or the codes, political ideological codes in the, in the countries in which they were trying to promote these values. And of course, uh, these were authoritarian states. And I think that Russia, especially in the last years, uh, last eight years, uh, partially it was because of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and Russia at that time needed to somehow justify their, uh, their policies and in the situation when the European countries, majority of European countries, members of European Union, the Western community of states, they started to support Ukraine and uh, Russia started uh, the, its uh, activities in formation wars, different kind of, uh, of uh, measures uh, against not only Ukraine, which was the main target of uh, the military power of Russia, but also uh, neighboring countries, uh, alliance of uh, Ukraine and NATO and, and European Union. I think that it was a crucial moment for uh, researchers to start analyzing uh, the specificity of this so-called public diplomacy or as uh, we, we know this term soft power, but it wasn't really soft power. It was something, something more brutal, something more really sharp. And uh, how just a couple of sentences, sentences about, about uh, sharp power in the hands of authoritarian regimes. So first, uh, this uh, kind of activities and promotion of its uh, influence in other countries, it's, I mean, uh, of their authoritarian states, it's malign and aggressive. It has malign and aggressive nature. While authoritarian governments, uh, governments domestically is typical for the states, they also support the authoritarian regimes and authoritarian influence internationally. Uh, the main appeal is rather negative, not positive. So not to present some positive alternatives, but rather to destroy something which uh, authoritarian regimes uh, disagree with. Of course, uh, methods of political manipulations, creation of domestic political lobbies, I mean, domestic inside the countries in which these methods are applied. Uh, but these political lobbies uh, in favor of hostile authoritarian regimes, propaganda expansion, uh, expansion of state media of these states outward, uh, information or rather disinformation aggression, corruption, subversive activities, smear campaigns, and even secret services active measures. So how uh, sharp power mechanism works in Central Europe. I think that there are some peculiarities uh, concerning uh, Russia's system of soft power in Central Europe. And these peculiarities, they, uh, re they are related to uh, the fact uh, that uh, the conceptual bas basis of Russia, Russia's uh, soft power mechanism is a full-scale rejection of liberal democracy as a model of social order. And this rejection eventually leads to the formation of international alliances and partnerships between Russia and those social and political forces inside different countries and of different ideological orientations that are considered by Russia, Russia itself as an adversary of liberal democracy. So Russia is trying through its soft power to form political environment in, in these countries and uh, Central European countries, and I consider Central, Central European region broadly, so from Baltic states through Central Europe, V4 group, uh, uh, till uh, the ba Balkan states and also uh, Black Sea states. So in this region, uh, all these states, the current states, uh, they are post-communist states, 
three Baltic states are post-Soviet states. And of course, it's something which gives uh, Russian soft power specific, specific direction. Uh, the system forming framework of the Russian state's policy toward these countries is a combination of great power approach to foreign policy with the rejection, as I said, said democracy as a principle and principles of free choice of nations. So this policy can be characterized as a mixture, is a mixture of two, two approach, geopolitical revisionism. And now we see how Russia applied this uh, method directly in military in military military way uh, toward Ukraine and socio-political revanchism. Socio-political re revanchism of Russian soft power manifests itself primarily primarily in the desire to reverse the social reforms that allowed the countries of Central and Eastern U Europe to radically change their internal structure and external orientation. What the current uh, Russian regime views as a development leading to the weakening of the Russia state's position, because uh, uh, I mean it's it's typical uh, typical consideration of uh, development of post-socialist or post-Soviet, some post-Soviet countries after the collapse of communism as a running to the West. So in this perception, Russia is losing. Russia is losing something. Russia is losing Ukraine. Russia lost Baltic states. Russia lost Central European states. And Russia, because uh, the perception is that Russia is losing something, uh, and Russian foreign policy, de facto, from the beginning of creation of Russian Federation was revanchist and revisionist, started to conduct pra practical steps to reverse to reverse this uh, this process. Uh, concerning the narratives, concerning the narratives which Russian soft power is applying in Central European states, I think that uh, especially in V4 countries, but also in the broader region, there are three, I would say, systemic narratives which Russian uh, uh, propaganda mechanism and Russian soft power uses in Central Europe. The first is, I already mentioned, but just a couple, a couple of words more. It's a narrative about inappropriateness of liberal democracy for the Central European states. So all this description of liberal democracy as a corrupt, inefficient, uh, non-beneficial non for, uh, for the Central European states, that uh, liberal democracies are not delivering, that liberal democracies cannot provide good conditions of life for, for these countries. So this, is, this narrative is widely, this basic narrative and some offspring smaller situational narratives are very widely spread in our countries. And of course, uh, we can see uh, the domestic, our domestic promoters of these narratives, all these illiberal authoritarian populist, populist forces, either on the right side, I think that they are stronger. It's a right-wing populist, neo-Nazi, fascist movement and groups, but also some, some leftists. Uh, leftists which are tending to radical uh, concepts of, uh, of left movement, communist, neo-communist. So these narratives are promoted by as I said, Russians of power, but with the support of, uh, of domestic actors. The second narrative, which is relevant for some Central European countries, not all of them, but quite substantial portion of these countries, it's a narrative which is presenting the, pre uh, preferring the ethno-linguistic proximity over the universal values. And it's narrative about so-called Slavic solidarity. So in countries with the predominant uh, Slavic population, it's uh, among the former Soviet republics, Ukraine and Belarus, but in Central Europe, it's Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and other uh, countries of Western Balkan, Balkans. 
Russian uh, soft power is trying to persuade people that the linguistic cultural uh, closeness, so uh, the, the alleged common destiny of Slavic nations is more important for these nations, for these smaller countries, than uh, adherence to national, uh, to uh, universal values like democracy, freedom, and so on. I, I, I think that in some countries, uh, these narratives are relatively spread and uh, they have also some political support about na especially nationalist parties in, in Slovakia, even fascist parties are uh, following this line. Russian soft power is less uh, successful in Poland, of course, because of experience of Poland with the uh, decades and even centuries of the uh incorporate incorporated state of poland as a as a country into russian empire and of course policies uh, hostile policies of russian empire 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 against poland and Poles. but in other in other countries in slovakia for example in serbia partially not enough efficiently but partially it's still present in czech republic some some other some other states so what what uh, i mean what is the real situation i think that this uh, concept of pan-Slavic uh, solidarity or brotherhood, I think uh, the reality somehow uh, contradicts to uh, the intents of uh, Russia to use this narrative because today majority of uh, Slavic, the so-called Slavic countries, they are either in the European Union or in NATO, or they are trying to enter this integration grouping. So the idea that uh, linguistic or cultural closeness of the smaller Central European Slavic nations to Russia can influence their development. I think that, uh, on, I mean, on the level of the practical policies, I think it's not very efficient. So wasn't very, not very efficient because voluntarily nations of this, uh, in this region decided to join the integration process after completing the basic democratization process and they are members of uh, these integration groupings, but Russian propaganda is still working with this. And in Slovakia, you can see this in public discourse, uh, in the statements of some public intellectuals, some politicians, and of course, Russia is supporting this. And the third, I would say systemic creating narrative is narrative about predatory West. It's narrative about, uh, unjust and unfair policies of big Western states, Western European states, but of course, uh, mostly United States, that they are unfair to the smaller nations, that they do not provide the real protection of nation, of these nations, that they use these integration projects all, only for their own uh, advantage, their own purposes, so that they are squeezing economy of, <laughs> smaller Central European states, of, we know that reality is different, that uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, countries which joined European Union and NATO, they are today uh, more prosperous than before, they are better protected, they are stable democracies, uh, they are functional economies and all parameters of the life in, uh, in these countries, as a members of European Union and NATO, they are much better than socioeconomic parameters of Russia, but still the propaganda is, is working, uh, working with this. Uh, maybe a couple of words also about some issue which uh, in the last years was quite important for understanding of uh, uh, Russian soft power and uh, its activities in Central Europe. Uh, I think that Victor would agree with me that uh, for Baltic states, it's one of the crucial moment in uh, information aggression of the Russia against Baltic states, but the similar, uh, the same is valid for Poland, for Czech Republic, Slovakia, in some degree in Bulgaria. It's a memory wars. It's a wars between Russian, I would say propaganda and the nations of uh, the mentioned states about historic events which influence 
the, uh, the history of these nations, but influenced just under the pressure or aggressive measures of uh, either Russia or the Soviet Union. And all these, I mean, uh, famous cases of statue of Marshal Konev in Prague, or interpretation of Prague Spring, or Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and some other events which are creating the big discrepancies between Russia and, and these states, these nations. And I think that uh, it's very good illustration what are the real intentions of Russia concerning this, uh, uh, these nations and these currently independent states, because Russia is supporting and promoting these narratives in order to uh, reconquer in maybe in different organizational forms, these nations again. So I mentioned this revisionism and revanchism and one of the typical features of uh, Russian foreign policy today, it's more in more visible way today in Ukraine, but I think that uh, uh, our countries are not excluded into this kind of consideration. Re reconstruction, reconstructionist approach. So the idea of uh, current Kremlin regime, regime is uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, the approach is that if something went wrong in the previous development in history of Russia and its relations with other parts of Europe, the neighbors, maybe the former constituent parts of Soviet Union on Russian empire, then it's, it's possible to fix, it's possible to change, it's possible to reverse. And what now is Russia demonstrating in Ukraine, it's just on the base on revisionism and revanchism, Russia is trying to reconstruct the past, the past in the present and to, and to provide the future for this kind of uh, approach to, to social reality. Now, a couple of, again, a couple of words about, I mean, about these promoters of uh, Russian, uh, sharp power in the region. Of course, uh, Russian state propaganda, I think it was uh, well described by many uh, researchers, uh, Russian researchers, researchers uh, from our countries, but who are, who are the promoters of Russian external influence here in Central Europe? Are they really only marginal or they can influence the situation? Unfortunately, they are not marginal. Maybe Poland is a certain, certain exclusion, uh, very specific exclusion, but in other countries, in, uh, and, and Baltic states also, they are a bit different, but they're a bit different, not uh, uh, mostly because of uh, peculiar compo ethnic composition of the population. So it means that uh, uh, the, I would say vulnerability of uh, these states toward Russian information aggression is uh, related more to the fact that certain portion of uh, the Russian speaking population is more receptive to, uh, to Russian propaganda. But in our countries, we do not have Russian diaspora. We do not have Russian minorities. So it means that the promoters of uh, external hostile authoritarian influence coming from Russia, uh, this promotion is done by our local domestic actors, public actors, political actors. And uh, in Slovakia, we have a, a kind of ecosystem which formed, which started to, fo to started forming and today de facto it's established and form and started after uh, Russia uh, annexed Crimea and occupied eastern part of Ukraine. And today it's ecosystem of the different actors. So some public intellectuals, some civic organizations, some political parties, not marginal. So fascist parties, we have in Slovakia two fascist parties and both are pro-Russian. Then we have the pockets of pro-Russian politicians, uh, including the highest leaders of the, of the parties in the left part of political spectrum. So uh, now it's opposition party, but this party was uh, um, years and years, the ruling party, Smer Social Democracy. Smer, it's a 
translation is direction, direction to social democracy. And Mr. Fico was prime minister. This party today is uh, very pro-Russian and there are some leaders of this party, including uh, Robert Fico himself, but uh, even more some others who are openly participating, uh, not only in the committed spreading the Russian propaganda, but also particip they are participating in the public events organized with the uh, Russian embassy, for example, here in, in Bratislava. And of course, media. Uh, part of the media space in Slovakia is, uh, uh, is presenting the ideas which are not fully compatible either with our foreign policy orientation, so pro-Western po foreign policy orientation, or with the liberal democratic regime, uh, some of these media are the real media, some of them are just uh, pl pl online platform, but quite frequently visited by, by the readers. And this ecosystem is activating itself always in the situations when Russian regime or Russian sharp power needs a support. So somehow requires this support. Uh, then there are signals coming from uh, from Moscow, and this ecosystem starts to 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 be visible. So they are influencing public discourse, especially now, since uh, the end of February, beginning of March. In the case of Russian-Ukrainian war, they are openly or hiddenly on the side of Russia. They are introducing different narratives uh, to uh, most popular narratives of this part of uh, public discourse is that we shouldn't, because Slovakia is very supportive toward Ukraine. Slovakia belongs today to the category of states which are supporting Ukraine, I mean, in proportion of its size, population and budget in the highest possible, highest possible way. We are th I think that we are on the sixth or maybe seventh place in the world. But, but our opposition and actors of Russian influence, they, they are now supporting the idea that we should, we should stop supporting Ukraine militarily by weapons because it's prolonging the war and it's causing more suffer uh, for, for the population. So it's prolonging the war and we have immediately to conclude, not we, but I mean, Russia and Ukraine, the peace, peace, peace agreement, but what it would mean it would mean, according to uh, logical, I mean, logic of this approach, that Ukraine should accept uh, the status quo, and then for Russia it will be uh, beneficial. And of course, uh, we know that Russia, Russian leadership decided to really to conquer, to conquer everything what Russia consider as its uh, former maybe uh, assets. And the second narrative is that uh, because of uh, quite uh, difficult economic situation and social situation in Slovakia, now we have on our territory almost 90,000 Ukrainian refugees, mostly uh, female refugees with children, that Ukrainians are taking Slovaks' uh, social benefits and it, uh, it's unjust. We should, uh, we should somehow stop doing this and then the logic is that we would expel them after these uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, to, to Ukraine. So uh, maybe now I, I finish and in, in the discussion, I would, I would maybe explain in more detailed uh, manner some uh, statements which I made during my presentation. And of course, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this event. So both uh, Alfred uh, Etkin, Ekin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization and European Center for Populism Studies for inviting me and especially Kainat Shakil for preparation of this debate, your communication with us, uh, preparing materials and preparing this scenario. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gregory, for the really wonderful um, insight helping us to tease out the complexities and nuances in terms of Russian um, role in Central European countries. Um, it is more likely that we're going to extend our panel. And last but definitely not the least, let's welcome Tisha. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, hopefully, you still have um, patience to hear me out. Um, let me try and share my screen um, and we can get the ball rolling. Um, can I just see a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Okay, perfect. Um, as you can see, um, I'll try and tell you a little bit more about what Russia does in um, in the Balkans. Um, I so far I've been studying very in depth the Western Balkans, um, and by the Western Balkans we usually mean um, Albania, a NATO member, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, Kosovo. Um, Serbia, uh, North Macedonia and Montenegro, both North Macedonia and Montenegro are NATO members now. Um, but for the last few um, few months, uh, I've been um, studying in the Bulgaria as well and what Russia does in Bulgaria. So while here I'm focusing more on the Western Balkans, I'll try and make some, um, some connections to Bulgaria, uh, because although Bulgaria is both an EU and NATO member, um, I believe Russia's shell power is actually uh, most intense here. Um, I would also try and be very, very brief, um, give you the overview. Uh, but if you are interested in more of like the narratives that we are, we've been tracking in the Western Balkans and Bulgaria, um, the kind of like the, um, the modus operandi and so on, please do let me know and I'll try and answer um, any questions I, I can either here during the discussion time or afterwards um, over email or something. Um, so kind of um, one, one of the um, guiding principles we, we've had uh, back when I was at NATO Stratcom Center um, and since then um, is that Russia sees itself as a as a very much a senior stakeholder um, in what's happening in the Western Balkans. Um, it's um, its will is really be part of uh, part of the discourse here, in one way or another, um, and it kind of kind of has um, a few uh, a few key priorities. Um, one of it is defending. Um, what it believes is its sphere of influence against the West, protecting its corner. So this is um, this is the area here in Eastern Europe uh, which um, Russia sees as its yard, backyard, um, and really trying to be a global power. Um, and I think these are strategic priorities um, for Russia as a whole um, in, uh, for all of its operations in Eastern Europe. But what makes it different in um, in the Balkans? Um, is um, on one side, the Balkans are very vulnerable to malign influence. It doesn't have to be external, it could be internal, it doesn't have to be from Russia, it could be from the PRC or uh, many other states. Um, but really, the Balkans are vulnerable and um, it's, it's an opportunity for Russia. Um, and it's an opportunity for, for, um, for Russia to become a, a first rate player. Um, in what it considers European security affairs um, and really wants it to see, to see itself um, right up there with um, Germany, France, the UK. Um, in the Balkans, specifically the Western Balkans, we've got many tensions, uh, many, many conflicts simmering beneath, um, beneath the, um, the surface. Uh, and all of these are fertile grounds for malign influence. Um, and when I talk about malign influence, what, what I really mean is really um, this um, kind of uh, winning the hearts and minds uh, of the people through uh, manipulation. So kind of like um, uh, the essence of, of sharp power. Um, it, it really, uh, Russia really wants to have a say um, across all of these conflicts. So uh, when we talk about conflict, we've got, for example, Kosovo and Serbia. Um, still, Kosovo is not recognized uh, by Russia in uh, the UN Security Council and a few other states. Uh, we've got Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which I think all of us are quite aware of how much of a um, of, of problems there are within Bosnia. Um, including with Republika Srpska. Um, we've got Montenegro, where uh, kind of uh, the population is polarized 50 by 50%. So you have about 50% who want to be part of NATO and about 50% who 
don't want to be part of NATO and want to be close to Russia. Um, I think you've got Albania, which is a little bit safer on that side, but then Albania has um, Kosovo to think about. Um, and then finally, you have North Macedonia um, that, um, for example, the Crespo agreement with uh, where we talked about um, the name, uh, the name change of, of North Macedonia, um, that that's, that was something that R Russia really utilized for its own uh, for its own gains, uh, being like look <laughs> look at the West, it's making you really even change your name uh, for the sake of uh, you becoming an NATO member. Um, Russia, one one other reason why Russia is in the Western Balkans and really wants to be part of of the big players in the Balkans. Um, is uh, it sees a very, very kind of heavy Euro-Atlantic presence there. You've got several NATO bases as well um, in Albania. Um, you've got, so you've got both physical presence of, of, of Euro-Atlantic uh, values, but also you've got quite a lot of um, soft power as well. Um, and Russia see this as an opportunity to, to play um, an obstructionist role. It doesn't really have to do much. Uh, it can be just be there, part of the discourse, and it's already making a problem out of the whole thing. I mean, we are talking about Russia's presence in the Western Balkans currently as well. Um, and as I said at the beginning, a very big part of what Russia does is it uses the vulnerabilities within the Western Balkans. Um, it's really exploiting uh, what's out there. Um, it doesn't really have to put a lot of effort. It's cheap it's it's easy it's uh it's really a place for russia to to leverage um its position against the west um it's a just attacked um kind of um where russia sees the the west meddling um is it's like oh wait i, I can meddle as well um and i can i can be part of a part of this um of this world um and it's really thinking of like really giving um the west a taste of its own medicine um and we can see this in many of the small um uh, small tensions and conflicts that i, I was um, just talking about um uh there has been kind of um a historical uh, movement of what Russia uses in terms of its uh, um, its manipulation and information influence activities. Um, it, it used to be um, a lot about the orthodoxy because quite a lot of these countries are um, Eastern Orthodox countries. Um, then during the Soviet times, um, the, the, what Russia was mainly using was uh, its doctrination. However, Former Yugoslavia wasn't part of the um, uh, of the Soviet Union per se, but still it was playing on uh, on, on the communist doctrination. However, today um, and I think since 2014 um, specifically, um, Russia is is playing a new game. It's not it's not bound by ideology or any kind of like normative aspirations anymore. It's free to do whatever it wants and whatever it wants. Um, it, as I say, it can leverage really scarce resources, uh, but get maximum payoff. Um, as I say, it's not used, it's not investing a lot. It's not like in, in, in Africa where it sends Wagner um, soldiers or anything like this. No, it's still literally using um, the vulnerabilities within the um, energy sector, within the political sector, within the media sector, um, and really uh, placing itself in the middle of all of these. Um, and all of this allows Russia to have a great deal of room for maneuvering. Um, it can negotiate with a variety of actors. It doesn't have to really be on one side or the other. So it doesn't really have to play with the actors that are uh, typically on the left of the political spectrum who are um, historically um, more socialist um, and more communist in, in their thinking. No, uh, right now it's actually working quite a lot with the far far left and far right as well. Um, it can work with the business, it can work with the civil society um, and really, as I say, leverage and maneuver between um, different um, stakeholders. Um, there has also been quite of, uh, of a evolution um, in, in what Russia does um, in the Balkans over the 
the last um, maybe 30 years. Um, during the 90s, um, it was mostly about engagement. Um, that was, you know, that, that was a time of, of the wars in Yugoslavia. Um, Russia was diplomatically engaged. Um, it was one of the states that um, kind of voted against NATO intervention in 1999. Um, and that was a big thing for Russia uh, because up until today, it really feels humiliated that even though it said no in the Security Council, um, NATO still went and bombarded um, bombarded Serbia. Um, what's today, Serbia? Um, then uh, kind of like between early 2000s up until like maybe what 2010 2014 mm -hmm. um we've had a little bit of uh retrenchment and re relaunch um we had uh russian peacekeepers um withdrawing from kosovo and most in herzegovina um we had um south stream which then met, went into turk stream which then going back to south stream and now it's turk stream again um being um revised and then closed and revised again uh, but it's it's one one of uh russia's main um uh, main kind of focuses in the last in the early 2000s um interestingly um russia didn't block nato uh um albania and croatia becoming nato members um bulgaria also became a, a nato member in 2000 and or um however with the new kind of like the new batch uh, of nato members um north macedonia and Montenegro specifically um russia was kind of uh, using its sharp power uh to really um make people not want it um kind of uh again working on on the <laughs> on the back end of it all um and since 2014 we've got kind of like a, um, a send-off. Um, it, Russia is mobilizing and has been mobilizing um, political and civil society actors in the region, uh, meaning that it's really operating through a lot of proxies. Um, and I think one of the previous speakers mentioned this um, about the other regions as well. Um, it's one of Russia's favorite um, tools, um, really not doing the dirty job itself, but having people to do it for uh, for Russia. Um, Russia sponsored and pro Russian media has really gained influence. Um, and here I hear a lot about, you know, um, Sputnik Serbia uh, being um, operational in um, in Serbia. Um, we we hear a, a lot about um, RT, although RT is not that popular. Uh, because you don't have a local um, a local channel in the local languages uh we've got russia beyond the headlines in serbian we had um several what we call doctors um newspapers in um in serbia and montenegro uh which really look into um kind of like um alternative medicine and target the elderly population uh you had a few uh, media outlets in Montenegro during the golden years of, of um, Russian tourism in the, in the um, country. Uh, but what's even more worrying um, and something that we found, um, and I can talk to you about if you, if you are interested, um, actually Sputnik Serbia is not amongst the most popular outlets in the region. However, the narratives which Sputnik Serbia promotes, which are mostly anti-NATO, anti-EU narratives, um, they are very popular and they're being pushed um, forward by Serbian media outlets um, across the BCMC um, speaking um, area. So um, we, although like uh, although Russia sponsored and Russia owned media outlets are not amongst the most popular, um, pro Russian media outlets are, and that's the the worrying bit. Um, we've got energy, um, <laughs> the energy security sector being one of the uh, 
most vulnerable to Jar power as well. We can see this right now with the sanctions. Um, a lot of these nations are almost entirely dependent on Russia uh, for their gas. Um, so that that's that's a big um, that's a big big problem. Um, sorry, moving forward, I'm looking at the time. Um, as I said, we kind of like uh, when we were doing a lot of the research. Uh, about Russia's footprint in the Balkans, um, we constantly thought and heard um, that Russia has complete control over the media. Um, what we didn't realize until actually looking into um, and tracking the specific narratives was that it's not we're not talking about Russia-owned media, we're talking about um, pro-Russian media um, um, and really pro-Russian narratives being um, uh, spread through Serbian media outlets. Um, the toolbox um, um, of, of Russia. Um, all of these, I think, are somehow connected to, to sharp power, if not the sharp power uh, in terms of definition. Um, coercion is not so common, although it can be used. Um, Russia has been known um, to use kind of like military or economic uh, punishment um, in order to kind of like make countries in the region uh, behave the way Russia wants them. Uh, again, it's not the most common um, tool. However, cooptation and subversion are Russia's um, choice of, of tools. Uh, with cooptation, what we mean is um, Russia providing incentives um, to the so-called proxies. And here we mean politicians, businessmen, um, other like um, civil society organizations, um, media outlets, um, really uh, creating uh, relationships of dependence. Um, something that we couldn't prove uh, per se, but we kind of like heard quite a lot, for example, was that Sputnik Serbia, um, the news room of Sputnik Serbia, which is entirely led by Serbian um, and regional um, journalists, is actually housed in a uh, building which is owned by Gazprom. So kind of like this is um, a relationship of dependence. Again, we couldn't prove it 100% because there are no <laughs> um, documents existing, uh, but this is kind of like anecdotal um, proof. Um, and then my, uh, my, my most favorite um, tool is subversion. Um, really, um, and if you remember at the beginning, I talked to you about kind of some of the, um, some of the tensions and the conflicts which are simmering the background um, in this region. Um, and through subversion, through the use of, um, I don't talk about disinformation, I talk about information influence activities. So through the use of information influence activities, we've got uh, Russia really trying to um, influence the society as a whole, um, undermining um, their trust in institutions, which is very, very low, almost non-existent, um, and um, kind of like polarized society even further. And I'm talking about a very polarized societies here, um, and really, really making it, making these countries even more vulnerable than they already are. Um, As I said, um, kind of like trying to go more in depth in the in the three tools um, with coercion, um, we don't have uh, little green men on the ground. Um, however, we do have um, a lot of cyber attacks. Um, for example, the Montenegrin government is constantly being targeted by cyber attacks. Um, we talk about um, support from nationalistic groups. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, local far right movements are being one way or another supported by Russia, um, and this is um, quite visible. Uh, we've got tourism, um, a very interesting scandal was from Montenegro a few years back, um, with um, the kind of um, the ban on importing. Uh, Montenegrin wine in um, in Russia because of some kind of a substance which was completely um, falsified. Um, Montenegro was the, the the 
the seaside of a choice for, for many Russians until a certain point uh, in a few years back, again, uh, because of um, other political uh, political movements. And in, in a lot of these cases, Russia has been really trying to um, cause um, and use its positions um, economically or um, another way um, to get, for example, um, the wine, um, uh, uh, Russian tourists um, to go back to, to Montenegro. Um, Cooptation, subversion. Um, I really talked about these. Uh, again, if you have um, questions, you can uh, you can talk to me about them afterwards. Um, Cooptation is very serious in um, in Republika Srpska, um, where the president of Republika Srpska sees himself as the best friend to Putin. Um, subversion um, here we're really really talking about a, an easy in for Russia um, using a lot of um, information recent campaigns. Um, a lot of supporting for marginalized groups within the uh, within the, the civil society and societal sector, um, and I think the whole point of all of this is really uh, making the West look very weak, making the West look very um, not not the right choice for, for these countries. Um, ah, I've got some pictures, <laughs> um, kind of like the instruments that Russia Russia uses um, are diplomatic alliances. Um, oh, sorry, I'm 20 minutes in. Um, we've got diplomatic alliances um, mainly with Serbia and Republika Srpska. Um, and I had a friend of mine who called the, the relationship between Serbia and Russia kind of like friends with benefits situation. Um, so it's not it's not the given uh, diplomatic alliance, uh, but the two countries have been seen to be working quite uh, a lot together. Um, we do have a little bit of um, arms transfer, but it's not that much. However, it could be used um, as a sharp power tool as well. Uh, we've got a lot of humanitarian assistance. Um, there is a, um, um, a center in Nish in Serbia. There have been talks about um, such a center being, humanitarian center being, um, created in um, Bosnia as well, um, and um, these centers have been seen before um, to have to, to really be a, a home for spices. Let's say it this way, rather than um, providing only humanitarian help. Um, economic connections. I, I talked a lot about that a little bit. Um, interestingly enough, in public polls, um, a lot of people in the Balkans believe that Russia is their biggest economic partner, um, and it isn't. Um, it's very, very far from the truth. But that's part of the whole, whole really narrative and using small economic connections to, uh, to boost uh, the position. Um, we've got a lot of influencing over domestic affairs. We saw this with North Macedonia and the change of the name. We saw it with uh, Montenegro's uh, wish to join NATO. We see it constantly, Bulgaria currently, um, with kind of like the political crisis um, and, and so on. Um, the influence of domestic affairs is both um, official through official partnerships with political parties, but also unofficial. Um, Religious ties is all, uh, is a topic that international people really love to talk about uh, because they see the Orthodox Church as a very strong instrument. It is, um, however, there are certain um, aspects where we've got the Orthodox Church being very, very strong in Serbia and Montenegro, um, and not so strong in um, in other places. Um, as I said, we've got links with civil society, although these are not that obvious. Um, a very cool example is again with the um, with the bike with Putin's bikers uh, doing um, annual um, uh, crosses of, of the Balkans um, on their motorbikes uh, with the Russian flags and so on. Um, and as I talk about the information instruments in the information space, uh, where we've got Russian funded media, we've got um, Serbian media spreading Russian narratives and so on. Um, and I'll stop here. Um, and as I said, um, I can um, talk to you more about um, kind of like the narratives if there was um, interest.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasha and um, or other speakers, Victor and also Greg Rich. And now we're going to open the floor for our audience for any questions. And we probably have around 50 minutes for questions. Um, so we got the first question from Martin. A quick general question for any of the speakers. All of you have alluded in a way to a sort of disconnect between countries in Central and Eastern Europe and countries in Western Europe on the toolkit that Russian has been using for past decades. Is it your impression that in recent years or since the invasion really that is disconnect is in the process of amending itself or are there still existing misapprehensions? Um, mis so this is a question for panel speakers. If I, if I can start. Then, of course, I mean, this connection of Central European countries from their Western allies is the main goal of the Russian soft power and it's the main goal of Russian foreign policy. Uh, and uh, I mean, Russia, especially after Brexit, considers uh, this option, even organizational disconnection, not only, I mean, on the level of policies, but also the level of membership as a possible. But, uh, but, uh, Many uh, things depends on the configuration of national political elites. Uh, in some countries, uh, the foreign policy is a, it's a platform for national consensus. In some countries, uh, there are discrepancies between uh, the political actors. So, so far, uh, Russia wasn't very uh, successful in these efforts, but uh, I mean, they are not losing hope because in some countries, as in Slovakia, there are some political forces with, with uh, quite substantial support of the voters. And now, for example, Mr. Fico, whom I mentioned, uh, he is promising to change uh, the foreign policy orientation of, of the state after the next elections. So it means that the goal is still here to disconnect. And of course, the support for such political forces is de facto uh, provided by Russia. Uh, maybe I very short. I, I could uh, provide a short example. Uh, uh, quite often, when some uh, with outlets of uh, Kremlin disinformation or propaganda uh, presenting topic about NATO in Baltic states or NATO in Lithuania, they using very interesting formula. I could say we not talking about Lithuania as member state, but we talking about Lithuania and NATO, which is quite interesting example from my point of view. Um, I hope I understand your question right. Uh, please um, let me know if I'm not. Um, I think you're asking whether since the invasion of Ukraine, um, the West and the region each of us has been talking about um, have kind of like tried to uh, get closer to one another. Um, if that is the question, um, I'd say I think the, the West has seen the Balkans as a target uh, from malign um, actors. And I think the West really wants to um to play a bigger role however um i think if for example with the european union um the fact that there is no clear um path um for the western Balkans to be part of the european union i think this way they're actually make they're actually reaching the the opposite um and they're making the western Balkans feel even more lost and even more left out and um, maybe even getting closer to Russia. I really hope this was your question. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Martin. And we have three um, people raising your hands, Boland, Andre, and um, Kainite. So let's start with Boland. Boland, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. If 
fun. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting and eye-opening presentations. I appreciate the presentations of all panelists. My question is uh, to Gregory. Uh, dear Gregory, could we define the use of uh, shock power elements and tactics by Putin regime as an extension or continuation of uh, conventional warfare in the framework of Russian uh, revanchist and uh, revisionist uh, geopolitical interests? and its security and expansionist goals. Thank you. If I understood correctly, you, uh, you, uh, your question was about how COVID was used or maybe? No, no, shock power elements and tactics by Putin regime as an extension or continuation of conventional, conventional warfare. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, I think that Russian uh, Russia's intention is definitely to to use some elements going beyond of this sharp power toward the countries which are members of European Union and NATO. And here I would use this example of this ultimatum. Do you remember how Russia, in I think it was in December, the Russia presented ultimatum in which it demanded. NATO to return to 1997. Well, it's uh, I think it's something which, uh, of course, it's not the announcement of the war. It's not the start of the military operations. But I can imagine, it's just now my speculation, that if Ukraine uh, wouldn't be so successful in struggling against Russia, and if, God forbid, Russia would conquer Ukraine during the first stage of this war, then I'm more than sure uh, that Russia would move, Russian troops would move to the western border of Ukraine, maybe would incorporate Ukrainian army into the Russian army, and then again to present this ultimatum. And in this case, it would be ultimatum, which not only theoretically, but practically could be supported by some military measures against some countries, maybe the weakest countries of the NATO or European Union, and maybe even use, use of, of the military force of spectacular, I mean, spectacular occurrences, for example, bombardment of some places. Yeah, so fortunately, I think that Ukraine protected us from this scenario, fortunately, but uh, I mean, analyzing the positions of uh, Russian officials, it's clear that if they would have opportunity, they wouldn't hesitate to use even, I mean, steps of conventional military activities. How, how could you combine these military activities with these shock power elements in the hands of uh, Putin regime? Well, uh, political measures, I mean, creation, it just adjusting the political scene in the countries uh, to Russian ideas, forming uh, the actors, agents, for example, inside military forces. We still have, we still have some pockets of uh, people who are thinking in the way which are very close to Russian perception of, uh, I mean, in military forces. Uh, administration fortunately is doing something against them, but they are still here. So it means that it's, uh, yeah, on, the, on this stage, it's uh, just a preparation of something. It's definitely the method of sharp power, but on the next stage, according to this idea, these people would act as a, as a tools of uh, military activities. And uh, there are some paramilitary groups in our countries, in Slovakia, Slovak con conscripts, so, uh, so-called, and they they are showing absolutely clearly that if the war between NATO and Russia would start, they will be on the side of Russia, not on the side of their of their nation. Thank you. Thanks for the question, and I think the you know the distinction of shut power, soft power, and hot power has definitely threaded a lot of panel discussions um, at the very beginning. Um, so let's move on to our next question, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for a, 
a fascinating conversation. You know, I'm still trying to get my in my head around the idea of sharp power and how it's different from the traditional propaganda as a, as a means of uh, of uh, winning over a population. I mean, we've had uh, other types of propaganda decades past, whether dropping leaflets from airplanes or broadcasters such as you know in World War II, uh, who we, uh, people we knew as Axis Sally or Tokyo Rose, broadcasting in, with music and false news to try to influence publics against the war. It was not called sharp power then, it's traditional propaganda warfare. So I was thinking, you know, if it's if it's more a case of using a, a, a of having an ideological warfare beyond trolls and bots on social media, but drawing on underlying concepts of what our societies are and trying to subvert those, that Russia is an interesting yeah, example, as it shifted, let's say, from the Soviet Union, from the USSR, where its propaganda warfare or use of sharp power in some ways was to try to destabilize ethnic nations and suppress ethnic nationalism in favor of promoting a type of class, economic class identity, and by doing so, destabilize the, the sense that there is an ethnic identity to a state. When the USSR uh, shifted to Russia and lost its identity as, a, uh, as having transnational economic class solidarity, it latched onto ethnic national identity and found that as a tool to subvert the growing transnational identities that were existing, whether within the EU, uh, where um, ethnic identity was set aside for a more stable environment that where people could cross borders, there was free trade, and country states like Ukraine could exist containing multiple ethnicities that did not classify themselves as separate nations. And so it, perhaps is, is this an example of sharp power where it now uses ethnic national identity to both subvert unions such as the EU, while at the same time drawing support for its own claims to have a right to own the nation of, of, uh, of Russians that live within the false borders of this state called Ukraine, who really should be able to follow their ethnic identities and be part of Russia or be part of whichever ethnic area or ethnic nation you know, they claim to be. And by promoting that, um, uh, that story, that narrative, uh, it's created something which is seductive to other ethnic national states, many of which are in the Balkans and Central Europe, uh, you know, whether it's Hungary or whether it is uh, even uh, Poland, or in the case of actually uh, for Victor uh, as a uh, coming from a state which also separated from a Czechoslovakia based upon ethnic national identity. Yeah, how seductive is this as a tool? And is this a tool of sharp power? And how seductive is it at subverting the current uh, international order and perhaps a post-Ukraine war national order where there's there will be questions, continuing questions about what makes, you know, how do we see ourselves as societies and where do we see our allegiances? I'll stop there. Thanks, Andrew, for the comment and also the question. I'm a little bit cautious about the time. So, Kainia, can you, would you like to ask the question as well so that our panel speakers would be able to respond to both of the questions? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you, Fan. Uh, thank you uh, to all the present the panelists today for the presentation. It was very insightful to um, learn about how Russia's activities are impacting um, the nearby regions uh, to the country. Um, so my question is to all the panelists. It's open um, to any one of them answering it. From what I understand and see after all the presentation, it seems that Russia's sharp power interventions are sort of a retaliation or a response to um, West's attitude or presentation of ideas of Russia. So in this context, if we continue or West continues with the same narrative or attitudes towards Russia, how can sharp power be countered or how can Russia be engaged in a meaningful manner that it doesn't need to respond in such an aggressive manner to, um, let's say, uh, the West, which it, which, is see, which it sees as an enemy at this stage. So thank you. Um, maybe I could start to answer to or try to answer to uh, both questions uh, in um, some kind. It's, of course, it's uh, very complicated topics and it's hard to uh, answer shortly. Uh, but in Lithuania, for example, uh, with my students in Vilnius University and in military academy, we quite a lot talking about the uh, similarities and differences between Soviet propaganda and modern Kremlin propaganda or modern Russian propaganda. And uh, I personally uh, like this theory of uh, uh, Peter Pomerantsev and also Edward Lucas, but uh, uh, main difference is that today we have no ideological struggle as was in uh, uh, during Soviet time or during Cold War. And um, in fact, uh, today Russia not trying to uh, uh, like uh, uh, to prove that Russia is uh, on this right side or uh, have this true, but uh, trying to attack principle of truth. And uh, I like this uh, title of the book of Peter Pomerantsev, uh, nothing is true and everything is possible. And here we could find this connection to sharp power. Uh, it's not only a struggle of propaganda or struggle of uh, values or so on. Uh, Russia trying to make this information house in Western world too, and maybe first in Western world. And in this information house, uh, people just uh, could lose position, could not uh, imagine what is true, what is not. And of, of course, it's a destructive thing for, for our societies. Um, if I, uh, if I may, um, I'll try and answer the, the last question first and then uh, move um, towards the other one. Um, I think in in the Balkans, um, Russia sees itself as responding to to the West moving towards the East. It makes sense. However, um, what the West does very badly is communicating. Uh, and I say this as being part of the West. Um, it's the West doesn't feel the need to constantly um, talk about what 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 it's been doing, um, kind of like the things that that um, are good for the look for the local people. Um, and what the local people are left with are very high level politics where you you know um, the European says oh, uh, these countries cannot move forward with um, EU integration because of X, Y, and Z, and we have protocols and we have procedures and so on. Um, it doesn't really manage to talk about, uh, you know, how, for example, the EU managed to negotiate the deal with the, with the uh, car plates between Serbia and Kosovo, for example. Um, if, you, if, you talk to, like, if, you, if you talk to local people, they wouldn't know entirely how the situation got resolved, they'll just know, you know how it got resolved. So I think the West needs to really learn how to communicate with the ordinary people, quote unquote. So how to really try and, and talk about um, its advances, its um, uh, cooperation, um, about the fact that, you know, we really are trying to um, help the civil society grow, um, work with institutions to make them more trustworthy and so on. Um, I think it, this is one step forward. Um, I don't know whether this will necessarily be a response to Russia's aggression, um, as you put it, but it, it most certainly 
be a way forward. Um, I think at least for, for the for the local people in the Balkans to understand the value that the West is trying to uh, is trying to do for them. Um, in terms of the other question, um, I think you are spot on about the question of um, ethnic uh, the ethnic role. Um, in these conflicts, um, and I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't born during Soviet times, so I don't know how it was back then. But um, from from what's happening right now, Russia is really playing on the um, on ethnic tensions. As I as I mentioned, um, for example, in Bosnia Herzegovina, it's really siding with Republika Srpska, talking about how Russia is the only friend of the um, Slavic people of, of like, you know, um, is the only protector of, of the Orthodox Church and really trying to uh, to make people more um, to kind of like get them against one another from within. Um, yes, it is. Uh, it's, it, it is a version. Um, it is disrupting from the inside. Um, and again, the vulner vulnerability is already there. Um, these countries are I mean, Bosnia and Herzegovina is made of three um, entities. So kind of the vulnerability is there um, and Russia is exploiting it to the best of its uh, powers. If I can maybe complete the, this series of answer to the questions, to the beginning of the first question and to the second question. Uh, well, uh, how soft power uh, is different from propaganda. Uh, I mean, propaganda is a part of soft power, but soft power is a systemic phenomenon. It's about destruction of the system. Liberal democratic regime, it's a system. Uh, the current uh, so-called geopolitical arrangement in, in the Europe, NATO in the European Union, I mean, uh, and other things. So it means that soft power is specifically oriented to the destruction of something which the state considers as uh, unacceptable. So it's really something systemic. It's not only propaganda, propaganda is part of this. Then uh, the second question, I don't think that uh, the word retaliation is really the best. I mean, the West didn't do anything to what Russia has had to retaliate. I mean, the, the narrative that the West was moving to the East, I mean, the, the NATO or European Union. No, it's a free nations liberated from the dominant, liberated from the communist regime and liberated from the dominance of the former hegemon, voluntarily and freely decided that they will be part of the European family of nations. And then Russia is retaliating to this. I mean, the uh, hostile attitude to the outer world and specifically against the West is a tradition of Russian foreign policy, either in pre-Soviet time, during the Soviet Union, and unfortunately now. And meaning, meaningful involvement of the Russia into interactions with the West, I think that unless this regime is sitting in the Kremlin, is simply not possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions and also the excellent response. And um, we're going to wrap it up over here. Thank you so much for your attendance and our excellent panel speakers. Um, please be reminded that our video is recorded and the, um, the recording will be uploaded on YouTube. Feel free to go back if you want. And last but not the least, please give our panel speakers and all the attendants a round of applause. If you can, you have been amazing. Um, so. Thanks for attending today and hopefully we'll be able to see you next week for, at our next session. Thank you so Thank you very much. much. Thank Bye. you a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye